Yesterday, Microsoft announced Windows 11. Here's 11 things that they stole from Apple. How a future Apple Watch could stop a pandemic in its tracks. I'm Mike Cave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. Tim Cook said, I really believe that if you zoom out to the future and then look back and ask what has Apple's greatest contribution been, it will be in health and wellness area. That was a while back now and today not only will the Apple Watch monitor your active calories and minutes and also your stand hours, in the traditional rings, but also your background heart rate for abnormal signs, your blood oxygen saturation, irregular heart rhythms, and how steady you are on your feet. You can also use it to run a basic ECG too, although this isn't available in every country. It'll even call for help for you if you fall or are involved in a traffic accident. But what's coming according to rumours and in fact IPO filings for companies that make the future sensors and list Apple as their biggest customers, what's coming next could be much bigger but not quite as big in some areas as others seem to think. Now, for clarity, although we have some evidence of the kind of sensors that this company makes, this is more of a discussion of what we'll most likely get in future and how it could be used. Now, there isn't much clarity around what the Apple Watch will actually get this year in terms of new sensors. The options that are on the table that have been bounded around the most are a body temperature sensor and a blood glucose monitoring sensor, as well as possibly a redesign of the Apple Watch itself. Now, we could get one or both sensors, or we might get one and a new design, or we could get all three. We just don't know. And speaking of the new design, Render Boy Apple Tomorrow has, of course, rendered them out. And yes, we have used these before, but even if you've seen them, they're pretty pretty, so you can still enjoy them. The refresh design is expected to be in line with Apple's current design language that started with the iPad Pro, that's with the flat sides, and while these renders predate the images from John Prosser and renders by Ian that are based on more concrete data, I think they really capture what we'll be seeing. When it comes to the sensors themselves though, let's start with the blood glucose because that's the one that most people have been more excited about. Now I've seen a lot of articles mentioning how this could revolutionise the care for those with diabetes, but I'm not convinced that that's what Apple will do. For starters, it's only really this year that the existing sensors that are invasive have become mainstream in a way that doesn't still need finger prick testing when the measurements are out of range. I'd be delighted if the sensor was accurate enough to use for medical reasons, but it doesn't need to be in order to be useful. Assuming that it's fairly accurate, the Apple Watch would be able to give information on how different foods are affecting your blood glucose, how quickly your levels increase and decrease, which can actually make you feel quite lightheaded and crave food. So it would be really useful in knowing better how your body processes different foods and also how well your body is fueled for exercise. Not only that though, but in terms of diabetes itself, it could be incredibly useful for identifying the condition earlier. That way it'll be less likely that people will be diagnosed in an emergency situation uh, during a deep ketoacidosis, which is a very dangerous thing and actually the way that most people find out that they're diabetic in the first place. Early warning can get people checked out and into treatment much earlier. Now, as I say, I am enthusiastic for this blood glucose monitoring because my son, who is six, going to be seven very soon, does have uh, type 1 diabetes, which means that we do have to monitor his blood glucose. But he's got one of the patches that lives on the back of your arm, um, but we do have to administer it with a needle so it kind of clicks in and then it leaves a little uh, filament in his arm and that's kind of what it uses to sense the blood glucose in the blood. Now, less exciting sounding, but almost certainly at least as important, is tracking body temperature. Especially given the past couple of years, uh, we know that a fever is a very good indication of poor health, and having the Apple Watch monitoring your temperature in the background on a regular basis means that if you are getting sick, you might well be alerted before you even feel unwell. And also having that checking going on passively, just like your heart rate sensor in the Apple Watch, is going to be a very useful feature here, because if you don't know that you're feeling a bit rough, you're not going to check it. But how could this feature help to guide us against spreading infectious diseases? 
If Apple had a system that was using anonymized data from these watches, it could very easily identify local areas that were getting abnormal numbers of fevers and alerting local healthcare that there's a possible outbreak of disease in that certain area. Being able to then identify trends like this would be super helpful in terms of seeing where infection could be breaking out and also to inform the user that they have a fever and that they should self-isolate or at least limit their exposure to others and of course seek medical attention. Apple Watch is prevalent enough now that a good cross-section of the population would be contributing data so it could be really really important as a tool for getting ahead of any future infectious incidents. But what do you think? Would you be happy for your anonymized data to be used in this way? Is it any different from maps detecting traffic from how quickly people using maps are moving through the location? Let me know down in the comments. And as you all know, I really enjoy hearing from you. So if you've got a question to ask as well, hashtag I cave answers down in the comments section like the guys that are coming up right now. Carlos Cantu asks, I cave answers. Is it possible that Apple releases the M2X skipping the M1X? Because releasing an M1X in the time of the M2 generation makes no sense, and that might come as a big surprise to all of us. So, really interesting question. We have covered this uh, a couple of times, I think, on the show, because um, people have been asking about this in the past. But, yes, it would be kind of annoying to have an M1X coming out at the same time as the M2 generation. The M2 cores themselves are going to be faster, but the M1X is going to be overall quite substantially faster than the M2. Now, again, this is based on our assumptions, but we assume that the M2 is basically going to have the same kind of core configuration as the M1. So most likely it's going to have four of those efficiency cores and four of the high performance cores, along with something like an eight core, or we're hearing maybe up to a 10 core GPU. Now the M1X is going to have eight performance cores, so it's going to have double the number of performance cores regardless, and that is going to be what gives it the absolute power that we are expecting now it's probably going to be eight performance cores and two efficiency cores. Mm -hmm. But that does mean that we're going to be getting a lot more performance, probably 80% increase over the M1 with the M1X and about 20 to 25% on the M2. So that should just give you an idea of it. Yes, the individual cores would be slower, but if you look at a Xeon or something along those lines from Intel, they tend to have slower individual cores, but more of them so that they can uh, multi-thread and that is how they kind of get to the total speeds overall. Hopefully that makes sense. The Duke of Kidderminster asks, I have answers, which non-Apple iOS iPad apps do you find the most useful? Are there any you recommend? So there's a handful that I use every single day. It's really tricky for me when I'm making a video like this because uh, I don't pre-read these questions really, apart from to kind of paste them in. And uh, my iPad right now is in use, my iPhone is in use, and my spare iPhone is in use because that's the teleprompter. In terms of the apps that I use uh, quite often on a daily basis, other than the built-in apps, and I'll be honest, I use the built-in stuff way more than anything else. I use the stock mail app, I use the stock maps app, I use the stock notes app, I use um, the stock browser, I use Safari, um, I use the stock camera app for a lot of stuff except when I'm making videos for this, I am using Filmic Pro and the Filmic Pro remote app on the iPad. Beyond that, there's very little that's kind of regular other than like social networks. So I use Instagram quite a bit, um, Facebook, TikTok, Facebook Messenger quite a bit for work. I do have to use uh, WhatsApp for work, which is a little bit annoying. Um, these are not particularly interesting ones to you. I think Filmic Pro is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, it's very, very good if you need to do anything that's a bit more consistent with your videos. Um, I use uh, Procreate if I'm doing anything graphics-wise. So, for example, the for example the uh, Hello Mac that we made for the T-shirt designs, and also you, obviously you can get it on a sticker like this um, and a bunch of other stuff. That was all made through Procreate on the iPad using the Apple Pencil. That was that's how we made that. Other than that, um, Call of Duty Mobile does that count? Richard Dewar, I gave answers. None of the M1 commentators seem to have mentioned how well iOS apps perform on Mac OS devices. Those of us waiting for the 27 inch plus iMacs would love to know while we wait. Okay, and the reason that people haven't really commented on this too much is it's quite varied from app to app. So there's certain stuff that works perfectly well. Um, 
for example, uh, LumaFusion, which is a great uh, video editing app that you can use on the iPad. You can throw that on the M1 iMax and it looks great. However, loads of the stuff that you would have wanted to run on the Mac just doesn't run, which is really annoying. So things like the social networks, Facebook, the Facebook app won't work. Instagram definitely won't work. They haven't even got around to doing that for the iPad properly yet, which is really annoying. A lot of the games that you might have wanted to play on the Mac uh, aren't compatible either. And it's not because of technical limitations. It's because the developer is basically ticked a box that says, nah, I don't think so. And that's pretty much all it comes down to. Now, with the social networks, I will tell you exactly why that is. Um, and this is my interpretation, but I think it's pretty accurate. The reason why is that if they use the app, they have to adhere to the App Store guidelines, which is exactly what Facebook has been really annoyed about recently. The fact that uh, they have to uh, abide by the Do Not Tracks and all of the other stuff that goes on. So that's really annoying for Facebook. So if they don't allow you to use it on the Mac, then you use the browser and the browser is a lot less kind of restrictive with what they're able to do with your data. So... Um, in terms of the actual performance, they all run absolutely fine. The difficulty is some of them have really weird touch uh, stuff that needs to be done. If they use multi-touch, then sometimes that doesn't translate as well. Um, but anything that's just, you know, in terms of the raw computing performance, I haven't found anything that doesn't run uh, or stutters or kind of has errors with it. It's purely a case of it's harder because some stuff is just not designed to interact with a keyboard and mouse. And Apple's gone part of the way there with uh, extra keystrokes that you can map to gestures, but it's a very difficult thing to do. And you don't get the same experience, really. Rob, oh, IK answers. hi, do you think that Apple will ever let the iPhone connect to a monitor and keyboard and mouse and function as a Mac computer running macOS? like Samsung does with their top phones. The A14 SoC on the iPhone is basically an M1, so with some modifications or putting the M2 on the next A15 iPhone, the iPhone could run macOS when connected to a monitor, keyboard and mouse. If they can put M1 on an iPad, why not on an iPhone? Okay, so there's a few things to unpack here. So the, uh, the iPhone is not basically running an M1. The M1 is more like an X chip, so the M1 is a lot closer to an A14X than it is to an A14, so it's got the extra performance cores, it's got double the GPU cores, and uh, in all honesty, if you were to put an M1 into an iPhone, you would probably get about two and a half, maybe three hours of battery life. So it is a very different beast. The iPhone would also overheat because even though the M1 does run very cool, it runs at about uh, 15 watts, I believe, and the and the iPhone is uh, much lower. I think it's around about 3.7 or maybe tops 5 watts, something like that. So, um, no, it's not an M1 and it's not going to be an M2 going into an A15 because the A15 is the basis that the M2 cores get pulled out of. Hopefully that makes sense. So, I don't expect that Apple will be able to do like a DeX style thing with um, the iPhones where you can connect it to a monitor and get a Mac type experience but it really comes down to the apps because if someone wants to develop an app that you can airplay to a, a TV um, you can certainly use a, a keyboard and mouse with that to interact with it so there's no reason that you can't do that already but it just comes down to the apps that are included but it ain't going to be Mac OS because you don't get that with an iPad either. Okay guys, so that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next one.